Welcome back again. Today we're going to continue in our look at carcinogens and look more closely this time and see how the carcinogen groups that we mentioned in the last lecture, physical carcinogens, biologic carcinogens, and chemical carcinogens, damage the DNA at a molecular level. Now all these damage uh, effects that happen to the DNA are therefore going to affect the information that's transmitted to the next generation as the stem cell moves up, trying to differentiate and become a functioning cell. And if you look at these mechanisms here and basically see what the results are, if you get a stem cell that gets severe injury to the DNA, then the cell's going to die and drop out of the replicating population. So it's not going to have any effect on the patient. If you have a neutral effect, there'll be no change. Remembering that about close to 80 or 90 percent of our DNA is just gibberish. It doesn't have any information function. Only a small fraction of it really passes information. But if we get upregulation of growth factors, then the host has a big problem because that cell is going to be heading out of control. And finally, if we inactivate growth restraining genes, and there's a balance of both of these in the DNA, then that's also going to be a big problem for the host. We have the first mechanism that we want to talk to in carcinogenesis is proto-oncogenes being converted to oncogenes. Oncogene is one of these genes that causes cancer in the cells, and they were actually discovered first. Then they realized this was the abnormal form of a normal cellular gene that was, uh, that's function was to regulate growth and decide when to move ahead in the growth cycle. And these genes, when they are inappropriately regulated to, um, faster and more consistent growth, then these become oncogenes. If you look at this chart here, comparing the two, the normal cell cellular genes tell the cell when to replicate. In the cell cycle, this is the cell going through one cycle of division. There are certain gap phases that cells can go into. They can drop out completely and stop replicating the way neurons and heart cells do, or they can go into quiescent state and then be called back. What happens in cancer cells is it's not that they're replicating so fast, but they just don't stop and they don't take the time. There are several checkpoints in this cycle so that the DNA can be examined and repaired if it's damaged. The cancer cells don't stop in that rest point. So the cells get released from the constraints of growth and these activation the activation continues to allow them to replicate inappropriately when they shouldn't be doing this. And the same thing with another kind of gene we'll look at called tumor suppressor genes, which are just the opposite. They check the cell and they stop it from replicating until repairs are made. The best analogy for this, for these two kinds of genes, on oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, is the speeding car. If you're out on the highway, beautiful day, the place is empty, you put your foot to the floor, and pretty soon you're going 110, you realize at this point you're in trouble, you may make a mistake, so you take your foot off the accelerator and nothing happens. The accelerator is stuck. That's what happens when a proto-oncogene becomes an oncogene. The accelerator is stuck. So in your, in your pa panic, you then switch to the other pedal and jam on the brakes and nothing happens. The pedal goes to the floor and that's what happens when you inactivate the braking system or the tumor suppressor gene. And there can only be one outcome from this. You're going to either crash and die, which can happen to these cells, or you're going to crash and, and be very, very badly damaged. When this happens to a cell, it's very bad for the cell and for the host. Now, the other, hypo the other analogy, I don't like to go too far with analogies, but the other analogy is the typing analogy. Remember, there is a four-letter code in DNA, A, T, C, and G, and they have to reciprocally line up when cells replicate and copy their DNA. 
what happens if you were to sit there and type very slowly, A, C, C, G, G, T, A, T, and so on, you'd probably make no mistakes. But the faster I ask you to replicate, uh, to um, type, sooner or later you're going to make more and more mistakes. And that again is what happens. Continuous fast replication without time for checking for errors leads to errors in the DNA. How this happens at a molecular basis, it occurs in several ways. First of all, it can occur here with increased growth factor production. Here's the mutated gene in the DNA, the one that got messed up, and either from chemical means or the biologic or the radiation means, and it produces too much growth factor, and it doesn't turn off. It just floods the system with growth factor, and you have these things called transducers. Transducers are molecules with an external domain and an internal domain, and they send signals from the outside to the inside. Most of the time, these signals come from somewhere else, another cell, but here they come from the cell itself. They auto-regulate, and they flood the signal so it just keeps replicating. Or you can have a normal amount of this uh, molecule and have just too many receptors that turn on and cause replication. Or you can have a mutation in the transducer itself in which no growth factor is necessary to turn it on. It just stays turned on, I guess like the toothpick stuck in your doorbell. It just keeps ringing and tells the DNA to replicate. And finally, you can have self-replication factors right inside the nucleus here that tells it to keep on replicating. So this is the upregulation of the oncogene that is the first problem and the first kind of problem, and it's the accumulation of these genes, not the specific order in which they occur, with one possible exception, and that may be in colon cancer. But for all the other cancers, we believe it's just that you get to a critical factor and a certain point in time where there's just enough of these oncogenes to cause the problem to move on. Next, we have the tumor suppressor genes. And again, these are normal cellular genes that have been inappropriately inactivated. And these genes um, are there to put on the brakes. They're there to look for errors, to slow things down, and to do something when an error is found. They actually proofread the DNA in two ways. They, they believe now that these um, tumor suppressor genes both read the sequence and also look for activity and function in the proteins that are produced by these sequences. And if they find an error, what they do is they stop the process, they force the cells into that gap phase or resting phase. And this is a comparison of what happens between the normal tumor suppressor gene and the inactivated form that happens by mutation. Its job is to stop replication, repair the damage, or if damage can't be repaired, to signal apoptosis. Remember, that's cell suicide. That's the active suicide that the cell can um, signal. It's really, again, the cyanide pill that the spy has. And it can kill itself actively, the opposite of necrosis, which is a passive death. And it produces active proteins that help in this corrective process. It also behaves as a recessive gene because if you have one that is still active and, and able to work, theoretically, it could halt the process. The oncogene acts as a dominant gene because it only takes one bad uh, copy in there to upregulate everything. So this is really a very uh, interesting intertwined uh, combination. What happens in the mutated form, it fails to recognize the errors, it fails to stop replication, and it fails to repair the damage. It does not signal for apoptosis, and then there are damaged proteins which can interfere with the normal proteins. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. The granddaddy of all these genes is P53. The P53 tumor suppressor gene we actually first thought was um, the, natural, the naturally occurring gene, what we call the wild type. That's what occurs in nature. And they thought this was an oncogene because 
it seemed to be causing mutations. However, they discovered what the, the, the structure of the first genes that they really could recognize were really the damaged or mutated P53. It's called P53 because that's its molecular weight, protein 53. And it is called the guardian of the genome. This is the primary uh, fact checker for DNA. And it is mutated in about 50% of all cancers. It is, um, uh, it, it is in about 70% of colorectal cancers. Well, so that's a very high expression of this mutated form. And about 50% of lung cancers. A lot of work has been on this, done on this. In about one year, there's been over 3,000 papers published just on P53. So it finds and deals with damaged DNA. And it's extremely important that it does this because in our attempt uh, to help patients, we often use things like chemotherapy, radiation. And what we're doing in those modalities, which we'll talk about more two lectures from now, is that we're going to try to get these cells um, to be injured by the radiation, by the chemotherapy, but we're not going to try to fry them. So that we want P53 to come in and recognize these and signal apoptosis. So when the P53 is damaged, it really hurts our ability to use radiation chemotherapy in patient treatment. Remember the Lee Frau Mini syndrome, which I mentioned last time, now may have more meaning for you, but these people inherit one bad copy of P53, so they're already in trouble. Every cell in their body has a mutated copy, and it only takes one more mutation to knock P53 out of the loop completely, uh, making these people very, very prone to get all kinds of cancers across the whole spectrum. And it's also a good prognosticator. If we measure the amount of mutated P53 in an individual patient's tumor, the higher the expression of the mutation, the worse it is for the cancer. So it's an independent prognosticator for the future of the patient. Those patients who have a lot of this uh, bad gene are going to do very poorly compared to others who don't. Uh, again, it's the speeding car analogy. The P53 sets off an entire chain reaction of downstream genes. P53 will turn on P21, a molecule that weighs 21 kilodaltons, and so on. And right down the chain, all these different genes are looking at and performing functions. And unless P53 starts this off, in its own uh, way of not only recognizing, but then instigating further action, nothing's going to happen. So the two together between the uh, tumor suppressor genes and the upregulation of proto-oncogenes, this is where you have the mechanism for the molecular problems that go on. How does it happen, for example, that chemicals can do this? Chemicals form adducts, meaning they join and are added on to the DNA molecule. And if you have a series of letters in a code and a big benzene ring locks onto that, when the other new chain of DNA is trying to replicate, it doesn't know what to pair up with. The C, G, A, and T has to reciprocally line up with the appropriate letter, and the adduct prevents it from doing so tell you a little bit more about how the viruses do that, and basically the physical carcinogens just break the DNA. We'll talk more about that later. The mechanism and the steps that occur are very, very uh, clearly laid out, and they tend to be fixed in what they do in terms of the sequence. And I want to look at a slide and show you exactly how that occurs. It's called multi-stage carcinogenesis. If you take a normal cell here, and uh, this is showing a cell now that uh, has a normal nucleus, normal DNA, and you expose it, now this is the stem cell. This is the stem cell that wants to come up into the population and replace the cells that are damaged. And you injure it with the virus, the radiation, the chemical carcinogens, any ones you want, and you don't kill it, what you make is a modification in the DNA. You now have a mutation, 
and this emerging cell that's trying to differentiate may have the chemical adduct attached to it, something that's causing structural damage. That structural damage is absolutely irreversible. It's going to stay in there and it's going to mean that error is going to be perpetuated because you now have this strand of DNA which has the adduct, the new strand which has the error in it, and when they each multiply again, they're going to make more cells with errors in them. The process though is still reversible. We are on the reversible side of this. So this goes on for a while and this may result in the activation or gain of function mutation or gene amplification that I just talked about. But the point is this is what we call an initiated cell. And the first phase of multistage carcinogenesis is initiation. You get this change because of one of the carcinogens. You will either activate a proto-oncogene or you'll inactivate a tumor suppressor gene. The next step is called promotion. And promotion is epigenetic. And that means it's not necessarily going to do any more harm to the genome. What the promoters are going to do is they're going to selectively whip that initiated cell and increase the replication in a cell now that has now been released from some of the constraints. This is the cell that uh, now doesn't listen to any other cells, may have upregulation, failure to put on the brakes, and is ready to be encouraged to move on. And again, the errors are going to be made because this cell is going to replicate continuously without allowing time for things to be checked. And even if they were checked, they wouldn't be repaired properly. So we have what we call rapid selective clonal expansion. These cells that are initiated are going to expand and they become still what we call pre-neoplastic. So we're still on the side of the line where the cells are not quite cancer and this process can be reversed. The clone is being initiated. This is all starting from one cell. So it's a clonal expansion and we're going to have further changes in the proto-oncogene development and in the tumor suppressor gene mutation because these genes are happening now because of rapid replication under the hand of the whip. The things in the world that are generally promoters are not generally carcinogens. They usually don't do anything to permanently injure the DNA but they reduce that latent period with a time that's required to get further changes. They're going to make more and more errors in this uh, um, process. One good example is estrogen. Estrogen tells breast cells when to turn over and when to replicate, and the more estrogen, the more likely there's going to be activation of new breast cells coming up from stem cells in the mix. Now, the breast cells themselves can ignore that. They have mechanisms and breaking mechanisms from other cells that say, no, we're not ready for you to come up, and they won't listen to the estrogen activation. In this case, the clonal cells are saying, yeah, terrific, let's replicate, and they'll listen to any signal to come up and make this clone expanded. Some of the most common uh, promoters in the world are, are names you're probably familiar with. Dioxin's a real bad one, the phenol group, saccharin the sweetener, cyclamate sweeteners, DDT was a promoter. Cigarette smoke condensates act by promoting as part of the chain, and so is UVB light. We mentioned aflatoxins in conjunction with hepatitis B. So hepatitis B, you have inflammation of the liver, Rapid, uh, rapid replication trying to replace the, the, um, the inflamed liver, and then this aflatoxin that comes from that aspergillus flavus, the, the fun fungus, and uh, this gives you uh, liver cancer, primary liver cancer, and don't forget chronic inflammation. We talked about that. So there is a group of chemicals called complete carcinogens, and that means they're both initiators and promoters, and these include those polycyclic hydrocarbons that I showed you in an earlier lecture.
Up until this point, everything is still reversible. This has not changed over into cancer yet. And we're on the side of the line that if you stop what's going on, there'll be no conversion into cancer. For example, if you've been a smoker for 20 years and you have all these condensates, you have the initiated cells, you may have some epigenetic promotion changes, but you haven't crossed the line. If you stop smoking at 20 years, if you still haven't developed lung cancer 20 years later, you now are back to the same risk as the average guy in the street, which is very, very low as the average non-smoker. At a certain point here on this chart, which is right here, there is an accumulation of mutations that gives all the cells or all the, the DNA in the cell everything it needs to invade, metastasize, become lethal. And when that happens, which is kind of a fuzzy time, we don't know exactly how many genes those are, we convert the cell into malignancy. Now the process is irreversible. This cancer cell is a cancer cell. It's going to do what cancer cells do. And we go from what we call genotypical changes to phenotypical changes. The genotype is what the DNA says. The phenotype is the expression. If you have a genotype that has one gene for brown eyes from your father and one gene for blue eyes, that's your genotype. You're a hybrid for blue and brown, but your phenotype will be a brown eye. That's what's expressed in the, uh, in the cells of your eye. In this case, we've moved from the genotype of potential cancer now into the malignant phenotype, and that phenotype can do everything it has to do to kill you. It replicates rapidly, it can invade, it can metastasize, and it can lead on to the death of the host. And what you need is an interesting pattern. If you look at, in this case, they took mice and they painted on, I believe, croton oil, which is a, a something that can serve to um, promote cancer in, in, in these mice that already had initiated cells. Now, if they just give the initiator and they don't follow it up with promoters, they don't get any tumors. This is timeline. If they give the initiator and then over time give doses of the promoter, then they do get tumors, malignant tumors here and there should be saying. If there's a long period between the time the cell is initiated and the time you give the promoters, it usually is okay. That, cell, that initiated cell is going to stay there replicating, waiting for promotion, and you will get a tumor again. But if you start promoting first, give, for example, high, high doses of estrogen, before you have any initiated cells to respond, there won't be any tumor. Or if you just give lots and lots of promoters over time, unless they're complete carcinogens, you get no tumors. And if the dose is spread out over long, long periods of time, you may not get tumors either. So there's a very specific pattern here. And this is why not all of these initiated cells go on to become tumors. The final event, however, is the conversion when you have enough of these cells and you move into what we call progression, which is merely the clinical expression. This is when we can find your cancer. This is when you have a million or a trillion or a billion cells that gets to the size of maybe an inch in, let's say, a breast tumor where we can find it, or even bigger in other tumors. This purely is the expression of cancer in the body, the clinical phase. And from here at initiation, till we finally diagnose it, or in this slide here where that first cell gets initiated, till here where we have clinical cancer, that can be decades. I mentioned that it can be as little as seven years. That was in the children who got leukemia after Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But uh, it's really a process of the amount of time. For example, mesothelial tumors um, can take as long as 40 years. Brain tumors, which are usually not tumors of the neurons, which is kind of interesting, 
if you think about this, I told you that neural cells, with very few exception, are not replaceable. We don't have many neural stem cells. So if we don't have many neural stem cells coming in, why do people get brain cancer? I gave this lecture to a sixth grade class when I was in Montana, and I was telling them all about the brain cells, and about nine hands shot up and says, well, why do we get brain cancer? if the neural cells don't have stem cells. I was just amazed because not one of my college students had ever asked me that question. It's a very good question. And the answer is the neural cells don't cause cancer. To get cancer in your neurons from that group is very, very rare. It's almost reportable. What makes the cells in the brain, the cancers in the brain, are the glial cells, which are the glue cells, the cells that look like neurons, but they're supporting cells. They hold the brain together. And those cells are being replaced all the time. Those cells are coming up from stem cells, and we get astrocytomas and other kinds of tumors that form the support for the brain. So these sixth graders really hit the nail right on the head. I was very proud of them. Again, it's important to remember that it's the accumulation of these cells and not the, or, uh, sorry, of these um, um, mutations that are important. And the one exception to this rule seems to be colon cancer. If you look at this slide, this is the normal mucosa of the colon. And we have an interesting experimental tool here. This is kind of nature's gift to doctors. We have a colonoscope. We can look inside the colon, and we could see, for example, here, a polyp forming or a big polyp growing. And we would have the choice in certain cases to leave it or take it out or to biopsy part of it and leave it there. Now, you may wonder why you would do that. There are times when, for various reasons, patients don't want these removed. Uh, either they have, are on anticoagulants, they're medically unstable, and so forth, and we may just want a diagnosis. In any case, over the years, with the millions of patients who've been colonoscoped and biopsied, we've learned certain things. That early on, there are mutations of certain genes that always occur first. This APC gene is called adenomatous polyposis coli gene. It's a gene which means that we get these little adenomas, growth, little growths, and these are called polyps in the C, in the colon. LOH is loss of heterozygosity. The APC gene is a tumor suppressor gene. And when that's lost, along with another defect in the DNA cycle, which we won't go into now, you start getting this little increase in cells, but it's totally benign. You then move on with another defect, and we know which chromosome it's on and where it is. This is called KRAS. RAS stands for rat uh, sarcoma, which is where it was discovered, and other genes. And this is a meth uh, an oncogene, and this starts to grow into an intermediate adenoma, still benign. Another set of genes is lost. This one's called deleted in colon carcinoma. This was one we found in patients who had colon cancers, but it was a missing gene. Very hard to find something that's missing, so it took a long time to realize what it was. And we start getting into the bigger adenomas, and then finally there are last few mutations, and look who's there, P53. And then we get true cancer, and here's what it's doing. All these were growing up in the polyp, and in, in what we call an adenoma. Oma meaning benign, otherwise it would be adenocarcinoma, right? This is the invasive form now. It's going through the mucosa into the muscle, and now we have carcinoma. This is an adenocarcinoma of the colon, and this sequence seems to be important, and it's the only cancer we know about where sequence seems to be important, and it may be the reason we don't get more colon carcinomas than we do, because if it were just random, we'd probably have a few more than we have now. And I showed you a slide the other day as to why we're not seeing so many colon cancers. They're just falling off like that. And the reason is right here. We can put a little snare right around this at its base or actually back here where it's before it's converted. Close that snare with an electrical current. 
take the polyp out and we remove the initiated and promoted cells from the person and we never get to this point. And we have practically wiped out colon cancers in that population who's willing to be colonoscoped about every five years or so because these take a long time to develop. And we should probably never see colon cancers if we would colonoscope everybody. That's the uh, end of this lecture, and we'll go on next time to see some more of the mechanisms of cancer.